situation come across something like that. And uh, Jason was, uh, was more than gracious to uh, agree to come back and talk to us. So, Jason, what was your name? Actually, finally got my camera. There we go. All right. Now we're kicking it. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a uh, fun thing because there's nothing that really livens up a Sunday nearly snowy day right after Valentine's Day than talking about massacres. So, uh, you know, I just thought it was something simple and easy uh, to get us started. We're going to talk about how it may feel like the first time, the very first time, and how we can help you stop fearing and begin to love your first mass casualty incident. And that, that really, is in the time of mass casualty incidents, love is not as much in the air at that point in time. So, we're going to go, we're going to go ahead and move along. Is it going to play the whole thing? No, good. All right. Because if so, I'm going to have to do a lot of dancing. <laughs> <laughs> what a great photo lesson I learned there. Um, it was actually taken on June 3rd of this past year, which I thought would be the Pilger Day, right? I thought it would be. Thought, same place, got all everything together, and I got this, which isn't bad. But that was anyway, the best. so you know how it goes. I also want to take a moment, and I want you all to thank your spouses, girl boyfriends, multiple girl boyfriends, depending on them, <laughs> and children who support you guys. Um, I know without my wife and my kids, I would not be the person I am today. And, um, and uh, that was that darn sexy person you all were you know, <laughs> dancing earlier. But I really appreciate them very much. All right, so just a quick shout out to my to me, I guess. Um, we're, we, I do offer a Storm Chase medical hotline. You'll be surprised to find that most of the time, the way I use the medical hotline is to suggest that you go to your doctor. But you're welcome to use it anyway. <laughs> if you want to just get a second opinion, I'm happy to give you what I can. Um, we're pretty thorough, uh, as Jeff Piotrowski learned. He was only smiling in the first part of that photo. <laughs> His prostate's fine, by the way, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> All right, so the uh, ambitious agenda that we're going to go through today is we're going to do some case studies. We're going to talk about some ethical issues. That's the creepy, who I don't feel so good about myself portion of the program. Um, we'll talk about safety, response and recovery, what I call chasers with chainsaws. <laughs> There's a story behind that. We'll get there. And then first aid principle, minding that all bleeding stops eventually, which is, <laughs> I bank on that. Um, and then we'll talk about at stake, steak dinner. Now, at home right now is Jennifer Giordano, who uh, turned uh, probably 19 today, the way she looks. And she's a fresh mom, and she said, oh, I'm looking forward to my shout-out. So Jennifer, that was your shout-out, baby. All right. <laughs> so, you know, it wouldn't be fair to talk about mass casualty incidents without talking about one of the most recent examples of this. Fortunately, Tim Marshall was able to help me out a lot. He actually was the first responder. He was the right shark because what he did was he provided <laughs> a very important event. He was able to be there while whatever happened to that shark. I mean, somebody put some glue on that guy. Uh, but Tim was there, and I really appreciated his assistance in that respect. All right. Um, as you guys know, several years ago I talked about Joplin. Joplin is one of the touchstone moments of my entire life. It was the best night of my entire career, as much as it was a heartbreaking night, because it transformed how I practice medicine. And nowadays, I'm further integrating myself into the medical community that focuses on disaster response, and have learned a great deal. Um, but Joplin was pretty incredible, and that's a great case study. And since this is a storm chasing conference, I'm going to do what I can't do when I'm talking to a medical conference. Um, the setup on that particular day was pretty amazing. <laughs> they were like, yeah, uh -huh. um, But, you know, there was this uh, included uh, low pressure system that was traveling off of Minnesota with a nice, long, trailing cold front. It was going to move east, southeast that day. And then um, this was, this was the morning sounding from Topeka. And I thought, that looks like a lot of energy going on right there. And I thought, wow, this is going to be an amazing 
today. Um, and then that was further confirmed when I looked at the dew point projections by the rock. And then here's the Cape values, which indicate that at least a portion of the core of the Earth was going to come up and rise <laughs> through southeast Kansas throughout the day, as heating would roughly be at, as soon as Oh, Dan is just a point yesterday, 239 degrees centigrade. <laughs> that was going to be the temperature, and that would generate roughly what we were looking at between 4 and 10,000 K, which is great. I was afraid I would get sucked up because I'm small. So, um, you know, so that was a good day for that. And this was this beautiful 700 millibar map showing that we had at least a thermonuclear cap down in Texas. Finding that balance was right here in southeast Kansas where I targeted. And this is what happens when you take a cold front, which is right there, lit up there, and you add a little bit of, you know, 9 million joules of cape. Um, this is what it does in an hour. It explodes, and though you can't appreciate it, you have odor for shooting top when you're seeing that. Um, now, I'll tell you what it looked like underneath this storm. It looked like what I had on my finger after I finished with Jeff Piotrowski. It didn't look particularly good. <laughs> did not have the visual I was looking for. I was just talking to Roger beforehand. I actually was ready to bag the day uh, because it was just a bunch of multi-cell, outflow dominant. And so I said, why don't we spend the night in job? <laughs> so I said, why not? And I did. Uh, I just was conscious for most more than I thought I would be. But, um, of course, that was the terrible Joplin day. That storm got very organized and then went absolutely ballistic as a tap. Every bit of cape in the upper atmosphere was incredible. Now, um, as many of you know, Joplin was one of the, actually I think it's the costliest tornado in U.S. history. It was not the deadliest tornado in U.S. history thanks to folks like Tim Marshall who helped improve our building codes so that we don't deal with that as often. But it was a pretty devastating tornado. And this was the tornado path. And you know, you just can't pick a tornado path worse than right down the middle of that town. Uh, everything in red is the high-end damage. It's not, it's not Carney, folks. It's Kearney, okay? And, I, I, and there's no Beatrice. What is that? I don't understand that at all. Yeah, oh, we have an answer. Wilker, with a hard G. With a hard G. Yeah. All right, now well, here we go. Um, now I know how to say it correctly, which is good. All right, so here's my uncomfortable questions for you and you guys at home. By the way, big shout out to my Chaser friends. Gotta say, love seeing Scott, Dave, Dana, Brad, Bill, Robert, and, and Jack. I think I got everyone, and if I didn't, you guys weren't worthy. Um, all right, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's already going to hell in a handbasket. This is a disaster <laughs> happening right now, involving all of you. That's okay. So what is the role of a storm chaser passing through a disaster area? This is a serious question. This is not meant to be, there is no right answer, by the way. Okay, so right off the bat. But I want you guys to do your gut check. Here you are. Choice one, stop chasing and assist. Choice two, call 911, but keep chasing. Three, become a photojournalist or act as a photojournalist, which some people do. Choice four, drive on. Now I will tell you that every single choice here is legitimate, okay? There's no right choice. But I think most people, if you're anything like me, couldn't feel comfortable with a couple of those choices. But here's the reality. When faced with a multi-casualty incident, the most common reaction to a bystander going through that area is, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to get the hell out of here. That's okay. Because you should never feel a moral imperative to do something you are not comfortable <coughs> with that, that goes against your ethics. All right, so deeper and more uncomfortable questions. Here's the one that I do think we need to ask ourselves. If the storm were no longer tornadic or photogenic, or the multi-casualty incident was not <coughs> due to severe weather, would I help? Because here's where the rubber meets the road. If the answer is I'm uncomfortable responding to a multi-casualty incident, that's fine. However, if the answer is if it weren't for that tornado, I would have stopped and helped. Now you've got an ethical point. Right? You have to decide that. Here, I would pose to you that if your answer is were it not for the tornado, I would have stopped and helped, you should have stopped and helped. Okay? If your answer is no under all circumstances, that's okay. 
But if your event, if your goal is to chase, and were that not there, you would help. That's a that's disturbing to me. And I got to be honest, the only reason it's disturbing to me is because I've had that same exact experience. I had a good job. I wanted to keep chasing. I really wanted to keep chasing. And through a series of events, that didn't happen. And I was grateful that that, that I went through, when the rubber met the road for me, I made the choice that I feel comfortable with. But I think before you go out chasing, you've got to answer this question. It doesn't have to be today. But I will expect it in essay format, and I want to see nice paragraph and capitalization. <laughs> All right, so what are the ethical issues? Well, the first is I want to tell you that you know, ignorance is no excuse for not, for not following the law. There is a lot of protective law out there to help us as chasers, if we wish to help somebody, called the Good Samaritan Laws. And the reality is they vary by state. But in short, if you are attempting to help somebody to the best of your abilities, and you end up failing or injuring them or causing damage or whatever else, you are not held accountable in a court of law, in a tort law, for anything that happens. That's great news. But there are limitations to it, and they vary by state. So here's the question. Do we ever have a duty to act? In other words, are we held responsible if we fail to render aid during a disaster? Well, the answer I thought was blanket, no. And there's a sort of at the end of that. So there actually is something we need to be careful about. Ten states actually have what is also called a Good Samaritan Law. And that says that California, Florida, and all of those, fortunately, aren't anywhere where I normally chase tornadoes. Those states state that you have responsibility to contact law enforcement so that they are aware of somebody in peril. That's what that is all about. Um, so just be aware of that. All right, what about if I'm in a rescue situation? I may have a duty to act, and that works like this. If I take responsibility for an injured person, I'm actually responsible for helping that person to some end point, other than me saying, that's it, I'm out of here. And you know, that, that's called a responsibility. So once you initiate care, you really need to transition it as best you can. Um, if you, by engaging in high-risk or reckless behavior, place other people's lives at risk, and your behavior specifically is what could have resulted in that person getting injured, then you're responsible. Now, this is a real tough question. But as we're going to talk about, chasers do some bad things to local communities. I like to think we're great people. We help the economy. We definitely do in those small towns. But we also clog roads. We become rescue. We become people needing rescue. If there's anything that was learned after El Reno, beside Tim and Carl's passing, um, and, and Tim's son, um, was that that those roads got clogged. Now, what effect does that have when we clog a road? Well, if there's a town waiting for an ambulance, and we're on that road, and it's clogged for five miles, we're actually introducing harm. And, you know, Roger and I were talking about it before. I kind of am done with I-35 for my Jason. I just can't do it. Um, because the roads are so clogged, it takes the fun out of it for me. It endangers me. But if my actions are leading to endangerment of others, part of this actually could be considered negligence. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Are there any lawyers here? There was one in the back. Can you leave for a second? <laughs> during most of my talks so that I can make sure I don't say anything. So far, if what, I, what I'm saying, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, good. My lawyer friend who I asked about this said, the best way to approach this is don't help. Okay? But don't cause harm either. All right, if you're a healthcare provider and you begin to care for that patient, so EMT, paramedic, doctor, nurse, if you start to care for that patient, you're responsible for making sure that patient gets transitioned to someone else. That's negligence. Now, no one's going to arrest you. These are, not, these are not criminal infractions. But these could put you in danger in terms of personal liability. All right. So, um, here we go. This is, uh, this is uh, not me. Um, but, you know, it could be me if I shaved my legs and grew a big face. All right. So, um, <laughs> The first one is rescue, all right? The most important thing is 
The rescuer safety trumps anybody else. So this is really one of those cases where, who am I in it for? I'm in it for me. And that's really important because that ties very closely to rule number two, which is, you know, see rule number one. Um, and repeat, safety is the single most important thing. And I'm going to show you what happens when safety breaks down in a second. <coughs> Failing this, you become a victim and therefore you cause more harm than good. People are very well intentioned when they try to help out on a scene. I understand the intense desire some people feel to try and save people who are screaming or injured in wreckage. I get that. I don't deal well with human suffering, particularly my own. But more importantly, other people suffering, I don't deal well with that. I want to fix that. I want to take it to another extreme. But you do more harm than good. So um, what does safety look like? Well, here's a few things. Number one is what I'm doing putting me or anyone else in harm's way. Again, if you're occupying your vehicle in the middle of the street and you're blocking rescue traffic, that's a big deal. Um, and do I have the proper equipment? Well, what does that mean? Well, in medicine we call it the personal protection equipment, or PPE. That means keeping blood, body fluids, vomit, urine, all of that stuff away from me, which is something I pursue regularly in my daily life. Um, but, you know, the thing is, what does that look like? Well, that's gloves, goggles, and gowns, the big G's. All right, what about proper equipment and dress? You're going to dive into some wrecked homes, right? So naturally, you have a hard hat, heavy-duty gloves, nose clothes, flash reflective gear, flashlight, and I forgot to put up there on there a ventilator mask, right? You guys have that, you know, ready to go, right? Because if you don't, you're putting yourself in danger. And what happened in Joplin is many would-be rescuers ended up getting lacerations, cuts, that later became severely infected. And some people inhaled spores uh, from some of the, there were a lot of fungal spores in some, of the, in some of the structures that were destroyed. They ended up inhaling them and developing a severe pneumonia. You don't know what you're going to get into. I think a few people died from that pneumonia. Um, so it's a rare deal, but it happens. So are you ready to do that? Ask yourself. If the answer is no, then you are not in a position to help people in that capacity, and you know what? That's okay. Give yourself permission to be okay with that. All right, so um, this is just because Ebola was really hot recently. This is me in my PPE. Um, this is a cool inflatable thing. It says, warning, Jason is actually, oh no, sorry, I don't want you to read that. Uh, no, but I mean, this, that's what PPE looks like to me. I want to be covered from head to toe in a positive pressure suit. All right, cue the video. This is going to be a tough video to watch. This is actually um, in Syria. There was a house bombed out. These rescuers, actually, the main thing that they're trying to do is bring out the dead bodies um, because the Islamic uh, tradition is that the, very, the body needs to be buried as soon as possible. So even though somebody's deceased, they put a very high priority on rescuing of the dead body. And you, there are a bunch of people helping. This is a bombed out structure. Um, and this isn't the part of the scene I want you to pay attention to. But notice how everyone is really working together in a concerted effort to do the right thing. Okay, they're trying to do the right thing. Um, and here they are up here on this roof. And there the roof goes. And there they go. And that's it. Structures are not stable after they've been hit by tornadoes. Unless you're a structural engineer, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference. When you go into a house that's damaged, you have no idea if it's going to collapse. <coughs> if it collapses on you, you die. So you need to really consider how this looks for you. Do you know how to deal with a collapsed structure? Even though you hear a two-year-old screaming upstairs, are you ready to do this? The most heroic action you can do sometimes is not to act. That's hard to believe, but it's really important. All right, so we talked about that. We're going to focus on response and recovery. And again, I want to call, uh, Stan Baker was here yesterday from uh, the Wichita Eagle. And basically, they ran a story in 2012, growing crowds of storm chasers, an increasing problem for law enforcement and emergency services. This isn't a chaser with a chainsaw. This is a rescuer with a chainsaw. But I want to relay what happened to me in 2012 while I was chasing with my partners. We were near Chickasha, um, I forget what the exact tornado started off, or Piedmont, somewhere in there. And it was on the two days after the job uh, storm, so I guess actually that was 2011. 2011. And um, we ended up chasing an area of Oklahoma where, which was under a PDS watch and ended up putting out some pretty PDS tornadoes. 
Um, and we got stopped on our chase when we had a beautiful tornado in front of us because power lines had been snapped and had gone across the road. And one of the storm chasers in front of us got out of his rig with a chainsaw to start sawing through the beam that was laying over the road, which was owned by the federal government, to try and make sure that we could continue to chase. So I figured Darwin in action. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's what happened. But that's the mentality we get, right? We gotta get there. And it was very frustrating for me because I wanted him to succeed. <laughs> you can take that any way you want to with that. But, you know, I, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to jump in there. And again, this is where things are becoming problematic as chasers are clogging rescue routes. And how can you be of service? All right. So we're going to start you off with a very important thing, which is that here's the good news. If you're a U.S. citizen, and I think even if you aren't, after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security, working together with FEMA, set up training, which get this, right? You get college credit for it, okay? You can do online on your own time, and it is 100% free. 100% free. And you can learn about the incident command system. Here's the address. Well, there it was. There it is again. Um, here's the address for that, right here. Um, and, and the benefit is you can go there and you can actually learn about the incident command structure. I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. But if you're a chaser, I really encourage you to do this. It, it takes about 20 minutes to do ICS 100, by the way. ICS 100 is just introducing an introduction to incident command structure. So it's ICS 100, and then if you're in healthcare, there's the uh, 100 HCB. I mean, they're, they're really well laid out here on the website. You just can go there and you can pick. And actually, you can take them all. Why not? Um, that's cool. And the reason you do this is because um, here's what they learned from major investigations of major incidents that went poorly. Okay? In the 1970s, there were a series of uh, fires in California. Many firefighters died, and they tried to say, how can we prevent that from happening again? So here's what they did. They created this ICS. And what they found was the most likely reason that most of these search and rescues, or this rescue situation failed, was because of inadequate management that from any, more than any other single cause. And how did, how did the management look? Well, very disorganized because there was a lack of accountability, including unclear chains of command and supervision. There was poor communication, often by using weird acronyms, 1022, or whatever. Um, uh, lack of orderly systematic planning process, which we're going to talk about next. And then um, there was no...